Chapter Fifteen of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One evening, a thunderstorm was brewing. The black clouds lay entrenched beyond the Volga, and the air was as hot and moist as in a bathhouse. Here and there, over the fields and roads, rose pillars of dust. In the house Tatiana Markovna sent her household, hurrying to close the stove-pipes, the doors, and the windows. She was not only afraid of a thunderstorm herself, but she was not pleased if her fear was not shared by everybody else. That would be free-thinking. So, at each flash of lightning, everyone must make the sign of the cross on pain of being thought a blockhead. She chased Yegorka from the anteroom into the servants' room, because during the approach of the storm he would not stop giggling with the maids. The storm approached majestically, with the dull distant noise of the thunder, with the storm of sand, when suddenly there was a flash of lightning over the village and a sharp clap of thunder. Disregarding the passionate warnings of his aunt, Raisky took his cap and umbrella and hurried into the park, anxious to see the landscape under the shadow of the storm, to find new ideas for his drawings and to observe his own emotions. He descended the cliff and passed through the undergrowth by a winding, hardly perceptible path. The rain fell by bucketfuls, one flash of lightning followed another, the thunder rolled, and the whole prospect was veiled in mist and cloud. He soon regretted his intention. His soaked umbrella did not protect him from the rain, which whipped his face and poured down on his clothes, and his feet sank ankle-deep in the muddy ground. He was continually knocking against and stumbling over unevenness in the ground or tree stumps, treading in holes and pools. He was obliged to stand still until a flash of lightning lighted up a few yards of the path. He knew that not far away lay a ruined arbor, dating from the time when the precipice formed part of the garden. Not long before he had seen it in the thicket, but now it was indiscoverable, however much he would have preferred to observe the storm from its shelter. And since he did not wish to retrace the horrible path by which he had come, he resolved to make his way to the nearest carriage road, to climb over the twisted hedge, and to reach the village. He could hardly drag his soaked boots free of the mud and weeds, and he was dazzled by the lightning and nearly deafened by the noise. He confessed that he might as well have admired the storm from the shelter of the house. In the end he struck the fence, but when he tried to leap over it, he slipped and fell in the ditch. With difficulty he dragged himself out and clambered over. There was little traffic on the steep and dangerous ridge, used for the most part of the shortcut by empty one-horse carriages and their quiet beasts. He closed his dripping umbrella and put it under his arm. Dazzled by the lightning, slipping every minute, he toiled painfully up the slope, and when he reached the summit he heard close by the noise of wheels, the neighing of horses, and the cry of the coachman. He stood on one side and pressed himself against the fence to allow the passage of the carriage, since the road was very narrow. In a flash of lightning, Raisky saw before him a charabon with several persons in it drawn by two well-kept, apparently magnificent horses. In the light of another flash, he was amazed to recognize Vera. Vera! he cried loudly. The carriage stood still. Who is there? Is it you, cousin, in this weather? And you? I am hurrying home. So do I want to. I came down the precipice and lost my way in the bushes. Who is driving you? Is there room for me? Plenty of room, said a masculine voice. Give me your hand to get up. Raisky gave his hand and was hauled up by a strong arm. Next to Vera 
sat marina and the two huddled together like wet chickens were trying to protect themselves from the drenching rain by the leather covering who is with you asked raisky in a low voice whose horses are these and who is driving ivan ivanovitch i don't know him the forester whispered vera and he would have repeated her words if she had not nudged him to keep silence later she said he remembered the talk with his aunt her praises of the forester her hints of his being a good match this then was the hero of the romance the forester he tried to get a look at him but only saw an ordinary hat with a white brim and a tall broad-shouldered figure wrapped in a raincoat the forester handled the reins skilfully as he drove up the steep hill cracked his whip whistled held the horses heads with a firm hand when they threatened to shy at a flash of lightning and turned round to those sheltered in the body of the vehicle how do you feel vera vasilievna he inquired anxiously are you very cold and wet i am quite comfortable ivan ivanovitch the rain does not catch me you must take my raincoat god forbid that you should take cold i should never forgive myself all my life for having driven you you weary me with your friendly anxiety don't bother about anything but your horses as you please replied ivan ivanovitch with hasty obedience turning to his horses and he cast only an occasional anxious glance towards vera they drove past the village to the door of the new house ivan ivanovitch jumped down and hammered on the door with his riding whip handing over the care of his horses to prohor taraska and yegorka who hurried up for the purpose he stood by the steps took vera in his arms and carried her carefully and respectfully like a precious burden through the ranks of wide-eyed lackeys and maid-servants bearing lights to the divan in the hall raisky followed wet and dirty without once removing his eyes from them the forester went back into the anteroom made himself as respectable as he could shook himself pushed his fingers through his hair and demanded a brush meanwhile tatiana markovna bade vera welcome and reproached her for venturing on such a journey she must change her clothes throughout and in a few moments the samovar would be brought in and supper served quick quick grandmother said vera rubbing herself affectionately against her let us have tea soup roast and wine ivan ivanovitch is hungry she knew how to quiet her aunt's anxiety that's splendid it shall be served in a minute where is ivan ivanovitch i am making myself a bit decent cried a voice from the anteroom yegor yakob and stepan hummed round the forester as if he had been a good horse then he entered the hall and respectfully kissed the hands of tatiana markovna and of marfinka who had only just decided to get out of bed where she had hidden herself for fear of the storm it is not necessary marfinka said her aunt to hide from the storm you should pray to god and will not then be struck i am not afraid of thunder and lightning of which the peasants are usually the victims but it makes me nervous replied marfinka raisky with the water still dripping off him stood in the window watching the guest ivan ivanovitch tushin was a tall broad-shouldered man of thirty-eight with strongly marked features a dark thick beard and large grey rather timid eyes and hands disproportionately large with broad nails he wore a grey coat and a high-buttoned vest with a broad turned-down homespun collar he was a fine man but with marked simplicity not to put a fine point on it in his glance and his manners raisky wondered jealously whether he was vera's hero why not women like these tall men with open faces and highly developed muscular strength but vera and you borushka 
cried Tatiana Markovna, suddenly clapping her hands. Look at your clothes, Yekorka, and the rest of you. Where are you? There is a pool on the floor round you, Borushka. You will be ill. Vera was driving home, but there was no reason for you to go out into the storm. Go and change your clothes, Borushka, and have some rum in your tea. Ivan Ivanovitch, you ought to go with him. Are you acquainted? My nephew, Boris Raisky. Ivan Ivanovitch Tushin. We have already made acquaintance, said Tushin with a bow. We picked up your nephew on the way. Many thanks, I need nothing, but you, Boris Pavlovich, ought to change. You must forgive an old woman for telling you you are all half mad. No animal leaves his hole in weather like this. Jakob, shut the shutters closer. Fancy crossing the Volga in weather like this. My carriage is solid and has a cover. Vera Vasilievna sat as dry as if she were in a room. But in this terrible storm... Only old women are afraid of a storm. I am much obliged. I beg your pardon, said Tushin in embarrassment. It slipped from my tongue. I meant ordinary women. God will forgive you, laughed Tatiana Markovna. It won't indeed hurt you, but Vera, were you not afraid? One does not think of fear with Ivan Ivanovitch. If Ivan Ivanovitch went bear hunting, would you go with him? Yes, grandmother. Take me with you sometimes, Ivan Ivanovitch. With pleasure, Vera Vasilievna, in winter. You have only to command. That is just like her, not to mind what her grandmother thinks. I was joking, grandmother. I know you would be equal to it. Had you no scruples about hindering Ivan Ivanovitch? this distance it is my fault as soon as i heard from natalia ivanovna that vera vasilievna wanted to come home i asked for the pleasure he said looking at vera with a mixed air of modesty and respect a nice pleasure in this weather it was lighter when we were driving and vera vasilievna was not afraid is anna ivanovna well thank you she sends her kindest regards and has sent you some preserves also some peaches out of the orangery and mushrooms they are in the charaban it is very good of her we have no peaches i have put aside for her some of the tea that borushka brought with him many thanks how could you let your horses climb the hill in such weather were they terrified by the storm my horses obey me like dogs should i have driven vera vasilievna if there were any danger you are a good friend interrupted vera i have absolute trust both in you and in your horses at this moment raisky returned having changed his clothes he had noticed the glance which vera gave tushin and had heard her last remark thank you vera vasilievna answered tushin don't forget what you have just said if you ever need anything if if there is another such raging storm said tatiana markovna any storm added tushin firmly there are other storms in life said tatiana markovna with a sigh whatever they are if they break on you vera vasilievna seek refuge in the forest over the volga where lives a bear who will serve you as the fairy tale tells i will remember returned vera laughing if a sorcerer wants to carry me off as in the fairy tale i will take refuge in the wood raisky saw tushin's glance of devotion and modest reserve he heard his words so quietly and modestly spoken and thought the letter written on the blue paper could be from no one else he looked at vera to see if she were moved or would relapse into a stony silence but she showed no sign vera appeared to him in a new light in her manner and her words to tushin he saw simplicity trust gentleness and affection 
such as she showed to no one else not even to her aunt or to marfinka she is on her guard with her grandmother he thought and takes no heed of marfinka but when she looks at tushin speaks to him or gives her hand it is plain to see that they are friends the forester who had business to do in the town stayed for three days with tatiana markovna and for three days raisky sought for the key to this new character and to his place in vera's heart they called ivan ivanovitch the forester because he lived on his estate in the midst of the forest he loved the forest growing new timber on the one hand and on the other allowing it to be cut down and loaded up on the volga for sale the several thousand desitins of surrounding forest were exceedingly well managed and nothing was lacking there was even a steam saw he attended to everything himself and in his spare time hunted and fished and amused himself with his bachelor neighbors from time to time he sought a change of scene and then arranged with his friends to drive in a three-horse carriage drawn by fresh horses forty versts away to the seat of a landed proprietor where for three days the fun was fast enough then they returned put up with tushin or waked the sleepy town in these festivals all class distinctions were lost after this dissipation he would again remain lost to the world for three months in his forest home see after the wood cutting and go hunting with two servants and occasionally have to lie up with a wounded arm the life suited him he read works on agriculture and forestry took counsel with his german assistant an experienced forester who was nevertheless not allowed to be the master all orders must come from tushin himself and were carried out by the help of two foremen and a gang of hired laborers in his spare time he liked to read french novels the only distraction that he permitted himself there was nothing extraordinary in a retired life like this in the white district in which he lived raisky learnt that tushin saw vera at the pope's house that he went there expressly when he heard that vera was a visitor vera herself told him so she and natalia ivanovna too visited tushin's property known as smoke because far away from the hills could be seen the smoke rising from the chimneys of the house in the depth of the forest tushin lived with his spinster sister anna ivanovna to whom tatiana markovna was much attached tatiana markovna was delighted when she came to town there was no one with whom she liked more to drink coffee no one to whom she gave her confidence in the same degree they shared the same liking for household management the same deep-rooted self-esteem and the same respect for family tradition of tushin himself there was little more to say than was revealed on a first occasion his character lay bare to the daylight with no secret no romantic side he possessed more than plain good sense for his understanding did not derive from the brain alone but from the heart and will men of this type especially when they care nothing for the superfluous things of life but keep their eyes fixed and deviatingly on the necessary do not make themselves noticed in the crowd and rarely reach the front of the world's stage raisky noticed in the forester's behavior towards vera a constant adoration expressed by his glance and his voice and sometimes by his timidity on her side an equally constant confidence frankness and affection nothing more he did not surprise in her a single sign or gesture a single word or glance that might have betrayed her dushin showed her pure esteem and a consistent readiness to serve her as her bear and no more surely he was not the man who wrote the letter on the blue paper after the forester had taken his leave the household fell back into its regular routine vera seemed untroubled and in possession of a quiet happiness 
and showed herself kind and affectionate to her aunt and marfinka yet there were days when unrest suddenly came upon her when she went hastily to her room in the old house or descended the precipice into the park and displayed a gloomy resentment if Raisky or Marfinka ventured to disturb her solitude. After a short interval, she resumed an even sympathetic temper, helped in the household, looked over her aunt's accounts, and even paid visits to the ladies in the town. She discussed literary questions with Raisky, who realized from the opinions she expressed that her reading was wide and enticed her into thorough-going discussions. They read together, though not regularly. Sometimes a wild intoxication flared up in her, but it was a disconcerting merriment. One evening, when she suddenly left the room, Tatiana Markovna and Raisky exchanged a long questioning glance. "'What do you think of Vera?' she began. "'She seems to have recovered from her malady of the soul. I think it is more serious than before. What is the matter with you, Borushka? You can see how gay and friendly she has become. Is she like the Vera you have known? I fear that this is not gladness, but rather agitation, even intoxication. You are right. She is changed. Don't you notice that she is ecstatic? Ecstatic? repeated Tatiana Markovna anxiously. Why do you say that, especially just at night? I shan't sleep. The ecstasy of a young girl spells disaster. End of chapter 15「Chapter 16 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Not only Raisky, but Tatiana Markovna gave up her attitude of acquiescence and secretly began to watch Vera narrowly. Tatiana Markovna became thoughtful. She even neglected the affairs of the house and farm, left the keys lying on the table, did not speak to Savelli, kept no accounts, and did not drive out into the fields. She grew melancholy as she sought in vain how she might seek from Vera a frank avowal or find means to avert misfortune. Vera in love, in an ecstasy. It seemed to her more than smallpox or measles, worse even than brain fever. And with whom was she in love? God grant that it were Ivan Ivanovitch. If Vera were married to him, she herself would die in peace. But her feminine instinct told her that whatever deep affection the forester cherished for Vera, it was reciprocated by nothing more than friendship. Who then was the man? Of the neighboring landowners, there was only Tushin, whom she saw and knew anything of. The young men in the town, the officers and councillors, had long since given up any hope of being received into her favor. She looked keenly and suspiciously at Vera when she came to dinner or tea, and tried to follow her into the garden, but as soon as Vera was aware of her aunt's presence, she quickened her step and vanished into the distance. "'Spirited away like a ghost,' said Tatiana Markovna to Raisky. "'I wanted to follow her, but where? With my old limbs. She flits like a bird into the woods, into the bushes, over the precipice.' Raisky went immediately into the park, where he met Jakob, and asked him if he had seen the young lady. I saw Vera Vasilina just now by the chapel. What was she doing there? Praying. Raisky went into the chapel, wondering to himself how she had come to take refuge in prayer. On the left there lay in the meadow between the park and the road a lonely, weather-beaten, half-ruined wooden chapel, adorned with a picture of the Christ a Byzantine painting in a bronze frame. The icon had grown dark with age, the paint had been cracked in many places, so that the Christ face was hardly recognizable, but the eyelids were still plainly discernible, and the eyes looked out dreamily 
on the worshippers. The folded hands were also preserved. Raisky advanced noiselessly over the grass. Vera was standing with her back to him, her face turned towards the icon, unconscious of his approach. On the grass by the chapel lay her straw hat and sunshade. Her hands did not make the sign of the cross, her lips uttered no prayers, her whole body appeared motionless, as if she hardly breathed, her whole being was at prayer. Involuntarily, Raisky, too, held his breath. Is she begging for happiness, or is she confiding her sorrow to the crucified? Suddenly she awoke from her prayer, turned and started when she caught sight of Raisky. What are you doing here? she said severely. Jakob met me and said you were here, so I came. Grandmother... Since you mention Grandmother, I will point out that she has been watching me for some time. Do you know the reason? she asked, looking straight into his eyes. I think she always does. No, it was not her idea to watch me. Tell me without concealing anything. Have you communicated to her your suppositions about love and a letter written on blue paper? I think not of the letter. Then of love. I must know what you said. We were speaking of you. Grandmother has her own questionings as to why you are so serious one moment and so gay the next. I said, it is a long time ago, that perhaps you were in love. And Grandmother? She was terrified. Why? Chiefly because of your evident excitement. Grandmother's peace of mind is dear to me, dearer perhaps than you think. She told me herself that she believed in your boundless love for her. Thank God! I am grateful to you for repeating this to me. Go to Grandmother and destroy this curiosity of hers about my being in love in ecstasy. It cannot be difficult for you, and you will fulfill my wishes if you love me. What would I not do to prove it to you? Later in the evening, no, this minute... When I come to dinner, her eyes are to look on me as before. Do you understand? Well, I will do, promised Raisky, but did not stir. Make haste. And you? For answer, she pointed in the direction of the house. One word more, she said, detaining him. You must never, never talk about me to grandmother. Do you understand? Agreed, sister. She motioned him to be gone, and when turning into an avenue he looked round for a moment, she had vanished. She had, as grandmother said, disappeared like a ghost. A moment later there was the report of a gun from the precipice. Raisky wondered who was playing tricks there, and went towards the house. Vera appeared punctually at the midday meal. Keenly, as he looked at her, Raisky could observe no change in her. Tatiana Markovna glanced at him once or twice in inquiry, but was visibly reassured when she saw no signs of anything unusual. Raisky had executed Vera's commission and had alleviated her acutest anxiety, but it was impossible to reassure her completely. Tatiana Markovna was saddened and wounded by the lack of confidence shown her by Vera, her niece, her daughter, her dearest child entrusted to her care by her mother. Terror overcame her. She lay awake anxiously through the night. She questioned Marina, sent Marfinka to find out what Vera was doing, but without result. Suddenly there occurred to her what seemed to her a good plan. As she put it to Raisky, she would make use of allegory. She remembered that she possessed a moral tale which she had read and wept over in her own youth. Its theme was the disastrous consequences which followed on passion and disobedience to parents. A young man and a girl loved one another and met against the will of their parents. She stood on the balcony beckoning and talking to him, and they wrote one another long epistles. Others intervened, the young girl lost her reputation, and the young man was sent to some vague place in America by his father. Like many others, Tatiana Markovna pinned her faith 
to the printed word especially when the reading was of an edifying character so she took her talisman from the shelf where it lay hidden under a pile of rubbish and laid it on the table near her work basket at dinner she declared to the two sisters her desire that they should read aloud to her on alternate evenings especially in bad weather since she could not read very much on account of her eyes generally speaking she was not an enthusiastic reader and only liked to listen when tit nikonich read aloud to her on agricultural matters or hygiene or about distressing occurrences of murder or arson vera said nothing but marfinka asked immediately whether the book had a happy ending what sort of book is it inquired raisky picking up the book and glancing at a page here and there what old rubbish have you discovered grandmother i expect you read it when you were in love with tit nikonich don't be foolish boris pavlovich you are not asked to read raisky took his departure and the room was left to the reading party vera was unendurably bored but she never refused assent to any definitely expressed wish of her aunt's at last after three or four evenings the point was reached where the lovers exchanged their vows the tale was faultlessly moral and horribly dull vera hardly listened at each word of love her aunt looked at her to see whether she was touched whether she blushed or turned pale but vera merely yawned on the last evening when only a few chapters were left raisky stayed in the room when the table was cleared and the reading began vikentiev too was present he could not sit quiet but jumped up from time to time ran to marfinka and begged to be allowed to take his share in the reading when they gave him the book he inserted long tirades of his own in the novel or read with a different voice suited to each character he made the heroine lisp in a mournful whisper the hero speak with his own natural voice so that Marfinka blushed and looked angrily at him, and the stern father spoke with the voice of Neil Andreevich. At last Tatiana Markovna took the book from him, with an intimation to him to behave reasonably, whereupon he continued his studies in character mimicry for Marfinka's benefit behind her back. When Marfinka betrayed him, he was requested to go into the garden until supper time, and the reading went on without him. The catastrophe of the tale approached at last, and when the last word was read and the book shut, there was silence. What stupid nonsense, said Raisky at length, and Marfinka wiped away a tear. What do you think, Verochka? asked Tatiana Markovna. Vera made no reply, but Marfinka decided it was a horrid book because the lovers had suffered so cruelly. If they had followed the advice of their parents, things would not have come to such a pass what do you think verochka vera got up to go but on the threshold she stopped grandmother she said why have you bothered me for a whole week with this stupid book and without waiting for an answer she glided away but tatiana markovna called her back why vera i meant to give you pleasure no you wanted to punish me for something in future I would rather be put for a week on bread and water. And kneeling on the footstool at her aunt's feet, she added, Good night, grandmother. Tatiana Markovna stooped to kiss her and whispered, I did not want to punish you, but to guard you against getting into trouble yourself. And if I do, whispered Vera in reply, will you have me put in a convent like Kunigunde? do you think i am a monster like those bad parents it's wicked vera to think such things of me i know it would be wicked grandmother and i don't think any such thing but why warn me with such a silly book how should i warn you and guard you my dear tell me and set my mind at rest make the sign of the cross over me she said after a moment's hesitation and when her aunt had made the holy sign 
Vera kissed her hand and left the room. A wise book, laughed Raisky. Well, has the beautiful Konigunde's example done any good? Tatiana Markovna was grieved and in no mood for joking, and sent for Pashutka to take the book to the servant's room. You have brought Vera up in the right way, said Raisky. Let Yegorka and Marina read your allegory together, and the household will be impeccable. Vikentiev called Marfinka into the garden. Raisky went to his room, and Tatiana Markovna sat for a long time on the divan, absorbed in thought. She had lost all interest in the book, was herself sickened by its pious tone, and was really ashamed of having had recourse to so gross a method. Marina, Jakob, and Vasilisa came one after another to say that supper was ready, but Tatiana Markovna wanted none, Vera declined, and to Marina's astonishment even Marfinka, who never went supperless to bed, was not hungry. Meanwhile, Yegorka had got wind of the universal loss of appetite. He helped himself to a considerable slice from the dish with his fingers to taste, and he told Jakob, whom he invited to share the feast. Jakob shook his head and crossed himself, but nevertheless did his share, so that when Marina came to clear the table, the fish and the sweets were gone. The mistress's preparation for rest were made and quiet, reigned in the house. Tatiana Markovna rose from the divan and looked at the icon. She crossed herself, but she was too restless for prayer and did not kneel down as usual. Instead, she sat down on the bed and began to go over her passage of arms with Vera. How could she learn what lay on the girl's heart? She remembered the proverb that wisdom comes with the morning and lay down, but not that night to sleep, for there was a light tap on the door, and she heard Marfinka's voice. Open the door, grandmother, it's me. What is the matter, my dear? she said as she opened the door. Have you come to say good night? God bless you. Where is Nikolai Andreevich? But she was terrified when she saw Marfinka's face. Sit down in the armchair, she said, but Marfinka clung to her. Lie down, grandmother, and I will sit on the bed beside you. I will tell you everything, but please put out the light. Then Marfinka began to relate how she had gone with Vikentiev into the park to hear the nightingales sing how she had first objected because it was so dark. Are you afraid? Vikentiev had asked. Not with you. And they had gone on hand in hand. How dark it is! I won't go any farther. Don't take hold of my hand. She went on involuntarily, although Vikentiev had loosed her hand, her heart beating faster and faster. I am afraid. I won't go a step farther. She drew closer to him all the same, terrified by the crackling of the twigs under her feet. Here we will wait. Listen, he whispered. The nightingale sang, and Marfinka felt herself enveloped in the warm breath of night. At intervals her hand sought Vikentiev's, but when he touched her she drew it back. How lovely, Marfa Vasilievna! What an enchanted night! She nudged him not to disturb the song. Marfa Vasilievna, he whispered, something so good, so wonderful is happening to me, something I have never felt before. It is as if everything in me was astir. At this moment, he went on as she remained silent, I should like to fling myself on horseback and ride, ride, till I had no breath left, or fling myself into the Volga and swim to the opposite bank. Do you feel anything like that? Let us go away from here. Grandmother will be angry. Just a minute more. How the nightingale does sing! What does he sing? I don't know. 
just what i should like to say to you but don't know how to say how do you know what he sings can you speak nightingale language he is singing of love of my love for you and startled by his own words he drew her hand to his lips and covered it with kisses she drew it back and ran at full speed down the avenue towards the house on the steps she waited a moment to take breath not a step farther she cried breathlessly clinging to the doorpost as he overtook her go home listen marfa vasilievna my angel he cried falling on his knees on my knees i swear if you speak another word i go straight to grandmother he rose and led her by force into the avenue what are you doing i will call i won't listen to your nightingale you won't listen to it but you will to me let me go i will tell grandmother everything you must tell her to-night marfa vasilievna we have come too near to one another that if we were suddenly separated should you like that marfa vasilievna if you like i will go away for good she wept and seized his hand in panic when he drew back a step you love me you love me he cried does your mother know what you are saying to me not yet ought you to say it then is it honourable i shall tell her to-morrow what if she will not give her blessing i won't obey but i will i will take no step without your mother's and grandmother's consent she said turning to go as far as i am concerned i am sure of my mother's consent i will hurry now to kolchina and my mother will send you her consent to-morrow marfa vasilina give me your hand what will grandmother say if she does not forgive me i shall die of shame she said and she hurried into the house heavens what will grandmother say she wondered shutting herself up in her room and shaking with fever how should she tell her grandmother and should she tell verochka first she decided in favour of her grandmother and when the house was quiet slipped to her room like a mouse the two talked low to one another for a long time tatiana markovna made the sign of the cross over her darling many times until she fell asleep on her shoulder then she carefully laid the girl's head on the pillow rose and prayed with many tears but more heartily than for marfinka's happiness she prayed for vera with her grey head bowed before the cross End of chapter 16《17 of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vikentiev kept his word and on the very next day brought his mother to Tatiana Markovna, he himself taking refuge in his office where he sat on pins and needles. His mother, still a young woman, not much over forty, as gay and full of life as he himself was, had plenty of practical sense. They kept up between themselves a constant comic war of words. They were forever disputing about trifles, but when it came to serious matters, she proclaimed her authority to him with quite another voice and another manner. And though he indeed usually began by protesting, he submitted to her will, if her request was reasonable an unseen harmony underlay their visible strife that night after marfinka had left him vikentiev had hurried to kolchina he rushed to his mother threw his arms round her and kissed her when nearly smothered by his embrace she thrust him from her he fell on his knees and said solemnly mother strike me if you will but listen the supreme moment of my life has arrived i have gone mad she supplied looking him up and down i am going to be married he said almost inaudibly what mavra anton ivan kuzma come here quick 
Mavra alone responded to the call. Call everybody. Nikolai Andreevich has gone mad. I am not joking, and I must have an answer tomorrow. I will have you locked up, she said, seriously disturbed at last. Far into the night the servants heard heated arguments, the voices of the disputants now rising almost to a shout, then laughter, then outbursts of anger from the mistress a gay retort from him then dead silence the sign of restored tranquillity vikentiev had won the victory which was indeed a foregone conclusion for while vikentiev and marfinka were still uncertain of their feelings tatiana markovna and marfa yegorovna had long before realized what was coming and both although they kept their own counsel had weighed and considered the matter and had concluded that the marriage was a suitable one what will tatiana markovna say cried marfa yegorovna to her son the next morning as the horses were being put in if she does not agree i will never forgive you for the disgrace it will bring on us do you hear she herself in a silk dress and a lace mantle with yellow gloves and a coquettish fan might have been a fiancé. When Tatiana Markovna was informed of the arrival of Madame Vikentiev, she had her shown into the reception room. Before she herself changed her dress to receive her, Vasilisa had to peer through the doorway to see what kind of toilette the guest had made. Then Tatiana Markovna donned a rustling silk dress with a silver sheen, over which she wore her Turkish shawl. She even tried to put on a pair of diamond earrings, but gave up the attempt impatiently, telling herself that the holes in her ears had grown together. Then she sent word to Vera and Marfinka to change their dresses. In passing, she told Vasilisa to set out the best table linen and the old silver and glass for the breakfast and the dinner table. The cook was ordered to serve chocolate in addition to the usual dishes, and sweets and champagne were ordered. With folded hands, adorned for the occasion with old and costly rings, she stepped solemnly into the reception room. But when she caught sight of her guest's pleasant face, she all but forget the importance of the moment, but pulled herself together in time and resumed her serious aspect. Marfa Yegorovna rose in friendly haste to meet her hostess, and began, "'What ideas my mad boy has!' but restrained herself when she saw Madame Berishkov's attitude. They exchanged ceremonious greetings. Tatiana Markovna asked the visitor to sit on the divan, and seated herself stiffly beside her. "'What is the weather like?' she asked. "'Had you a windy crossing over the Volga? There was no wind.' did you come by the ferry in the boat the kaleshi was brought over on the ferry yakob yegorovna petrushka where are you why don't you come when you are cold take out the horses give them fodder and see that the coachman is well looked after the servants who had rushed in to answer the summons hurried out of course the horses had been taken out while tatiana markovna was dressing and the coachman was already sitting in the servant's room doing full justice to the beer set before him no no tatiana markovna protested the visitor i have come for half an hour on business do you think you will be allowed to go asked tatiana markovna in a voice that permitted no reply you have come a long way from over the volga is this the first year of our acquaintance do you want to insult me ah oh, tatiana markovna i am so grateful to you so grateful you are just like a relative and how you have spoiled my nikolai i feel sometimes as if he were my own son burst from tatiana markovna whose dignity could hold out no longer against these friendly advances yes you are so kind to him tatiana markovna that presuming on your kindness he has taken it into his head well he begged me to come over to see you and he asks for the hand of marfa vasilievna 
Marfa Vasilievna agrees. She loves Nikolai. Because Marfinka took upon herself to answer his declaration, she is now shut up in her room, in her petticoat without shoes, lied her aunt. Then, in order to lay full stress on the importance of the moment, she added, I have given orders not to admit your son, so that he may not play with a poor girl's affections. It was impossible for Marfa Yegorovna not to recognize the provocation of these remarks. If I had foreseen this, she said angrily, I would have given him a different answer. He assured me, and I was so willing to believe him, of your affection for him and for me. Pardon my mission, Tatiana Markovna, and pray let that poor child out of her room. The blame rests with my boy only, and he shall be punished. Have the kindness to order my carriage. She placed her hand on the bell, but Tatiana Markovna detained her. Your horses are taken out. You will stay with me, Marfa Egorovna, today, tomorrow, all the week. But since you are so angry with Marfa Vasilievna and my son, who does indeed deserve to be punished, the wrinkles in Tatiana Markovna's face faded, and her eyes gleamed with joy. She threw her shawl and cap on the divan. I can't keep it up any longer she exclaimed take off your hat and mantilla we are only teasing one another marfa yegorovna i shall have a grandson you a daughter kiss me dear i wanted to keep up the old customs but these are cases which they don't fit we knew what must be the upshot of this. If we hadn't wished it, we should not have allowed them to go and listen to the nightingales. How you frightened me, cried Marfa Yegorovna. He had to be frightened. I will read him a lesson. Mother and aunt had gone a long way into the future, and when they were about as far as the christening of the third child, Marfa Yegorovna noticed in the garden among the bushes a head, which was now hidden, then again cautiously raised to reconnoitre. She recognized her son and pointed him out to Tatiana Markovna. They called him, but when he at last decided to enter, he hung about in the ante-room as if he were making himself presentable. "'You are welcome, Nikolai Andreevich,' said Tatiana Markovna pointedly while his mother looked at him ironically. "'Good morning, Tatiana Markovna,' he stammered at last and kissed the old lady's hand. "'I have bought tickets for the charity concert for you and Mamma, for Vera Vasilievna and Marfa Vasilievna, and for Boris Pavlovich. It's a splendid concert. The first singer in Moscow. Why do we need to go to concerts?' interrupted Tatiana Markovna, looking at him sideways. The nightingales sing so finely here. In the evening we go into the garden and can hear them for nothing. Marfa Yegorovna bit her lip, but Vikentiev stood transfixed. Sit down, Nikolai Andreevich, continued the old lady seriously and reproachfully, and listen to what I have to say. What does your conscience tell you? How have you rewarded my confidence? Don't make fun of me. It's unkind. I am not joking. It wasn't right of you, my friend, to speak to Marfinka and not to me. Supposing I had not consented. If you had not consented, I would have... What? Oh, I would have gone away from here, joined the hussars, have contracted debts, and gone to rack and ruin. Now he threatens. You should not be so bent on your own way, young man. Give me Marfa Vasilievna, and I will be more tranquil than water, humbler than the grass. Shall we give him Marfinka, Marfa Yegorovna? He hasn't deserved it, Tatiana Markovna, and it is really too early. Perhaps in two years' time... He flew to his mother and shut her mouth with a kiss. Then he received from Tatiana Markovna the sign of the cross and a kiss on the forehead.
where is marfa vasilievna he shouted joyfully you must have patience admonished his grandmother we will fetch her tatiana markovna and marfa yegorovna found marfinka hidden in the corner behind the curtains of her bed close by the icons she covered her blushing face in her hands vera received the news from her aunt with quiet pleasure saying that she had expected it for a long time god grant you may follow her example said tatiana markovna if you love me as i love you grandmother you will bestow all your care and thought on marfinka take no thought for me my heart aches for you verochka i know and that grieves me grandmother she said with a despairing note it is killing me to think that your heart aches on my account what do you say verochka open your heart to me perhaps i can comprehend and if you have grief help to assuage it if trouble overtakes me grandmother and i cannot conquer it myself i will come to you and to none other god only excepted but do not make me suffer any more or allow yourself to suffer will it not be too late when trouble has once overtaken you whispered her aunt then she added aloud i know that you are not like marfinka and i will not disturb you a long sigh escaped her as she left the room with quick steps and bent head vera's distress was the only cloud on her horizon and she prayed earnestly that it might pass and not gather into a black storm cloud vera sought to calm her own agitation by walking up and down the garden but only succeeded gradually as soon as she caught sight of marfinka and vikentiev in the arbor she hurried to them looked affectionately into her sister's face kissed her eyes her lips her cheeks and embraced her warmly you must be happy she said with tears in her eyes how lovely you are verochka and how good we are not a bit like sisters there is nobody in the neighborhood fit to marry you is there nikolai andreevich vera pressed her hand in silence nikolai andreevich do you know what she is an angel answered vikentiev as promptly as a soldier answers his officer an angel mimicked vera laughing and pointing to a butterfly hovering over a flower there is an angel but if you even touch him the color of his wings will be spoiled and he will perhaps even lose a wing you must spoil her love and caress her and god forbid that you ever wound her if you ever do she threatened smiling you will have to reckon with me within a week of this happy occasion the house was restored to its ordinary routine marfa yegorovna drove back to kolchina but vikentiev became a daily visitor and almost a member of the family he and marfinka no longer jumped and ran like children though they occasionally had a lively dispute half in jest half in earnest they sang and read together and the pure fresh poetry of youth plain for all to read welled up in their frank unspoilt hearts the wedding being fixed for the autumn preparations for marpinka's house furnishing and trousseau were being gradually pushed forward from the cupboards of the house were brought old lace silver and gold plate glass linen furs pearls diamonds and all sorts of treasures to be divided by tatiana markovna with jewel-like exactness into two equal shares with the aid of jewelers workers in gold and others that is yours vera and there is marfinka's share you are not to receive a pearl or an ounce more than the other see for yourselves vera pushed pearls and diamonds into a heap with a declaration that she needed very little this only angered tatiana markovna who began to work of division all over again raisky sent to his former guardian for the diamonds and silver that had been his mother's portion and bestowed these also on the sisters 
but his aunt hid the treasure in the depths of her coffers you will want them yourself she said on the day when you take it into your head to marry the estate with all that belonged to it he had made over in the names of the sisters a gift for which each of them thanked him after her fashion tatiana markovna wrinkled her forehead and looked askance at him but she could not long maintain this attitude and ended by embracing him in various rooms in tatiana markovna's sitting-room in the servants room and even in the reception room tables were covered with linen the marriage bed with its lace pillowcases and cover was being prepared and every morning there came dressmakers and seamstresses only raisky and vera remained untouched by the universal gay activity even when raisky sought distraction in riding or visiting there was in fact no one else in the world for him but vera he avoided too frequent visits to kozlov on account of yuliana andreevna he did not visit polina karpovna but she came the oftener and bored him and tatiana markovna by her pose retiring or audacious as the case might be tatiana markovna especially was annoyed by her unasked for criticisms of the wedding preparations and by her views on marriage generally marriage she declared was the grave of love elect souls were bound to meet in spite of all obstacles even outside the marriage bond and so forth while she expounded these doctrines she cast languishing eyes on raisky neither did the young people who now often came to the house to dance awaken any interest in raisky or vera these two were only happy under given circumstances he with her she when unseen by any one she could flit like a ghost to the precipice to lose herself in the undergrowth or when she drove over the volga to see the pope's wife end of chapter seventeen Chapter Eighteen of *The Precipice* by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The weather was gloomy; rain fell unintermittently; the sky was enshrouded in a thick cloud of fog, and on the ground lay banks of mist. No one had ventured out all day, and the family had already gone early to bed. When about ten o'clock, the rain ceased raisky put on his overcoat to get a breath of air in the garden the rustle of the bushes and the plants from which the rain was still dripping alone broke the stillness of the night after a few turns up and down he turned his steps to the vegetable garden through which his way to the fields lay here and there a glimmering star hung above in the dense darkness and before him the village lay like a dark spot on the dark background of the indistinguishable fields beyond suddenly he heard a slight noise from the old house and saw that a window on the ground floor had been opened since the window looked out not into the garden but on to the field he hastened to reach the grove of acacias leapt the fence and landed in a puddle of water where he stood motionless is it you said a low voice from the window it was vera's voice though his knees trembled under him he was just able to answer in the same low tone yes the rain has kept me in all day but to-morrow morning at ten go quickly someone is coming the window was closed quietly and raisky cursed the approaching footsteps that had interrupted the conversation it was then true and the letter written on blue paper not a dream was there a rendezvous he went in the direction of the steps who is there cried a voice and raisky was seized from behind the devil cried raisky pushing Savelli away since when have you taken upon yourself to guard the house i have the mistress's orders there are so many thieves and vagabonds in the neighbourhood 
and the sailors from the Volga do a lot of mischief. That is a lie. You are out after Marina, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. He would have gone, but Savelli detained him. Allow me, sir, to say a word or two about Marina. Exercise your merciful powers and send the woman to Siberia. Are you out of your senses? Or into a house of detention for the rest of her life? I am much more likely to send you, so that you cease to beat her. What are you doing spying here in this abominable way? said Raisky between his teeth, and he cast a glance at Vera's window. In another moment he was gone. Raisky hardly slept at all that night, and he appeared next morning in his aunt's sitting-room with dry, weary eyes. The whole family had assembled for tea on this particular bright morning. Vera greeted him gaily, as he pressed her hand feverishly and looked straight into her eyes. She returned his gaze calmly and quietly. "'How elegant you are this morning,' he said. "'Do you call a simple straw-coloured blouse elegant?' she asked. "'But the scarlet band on your hair, with the coils of hair drawn across it, the belt with the beautiful clasp and the scarlet embroidered shoes, you have excellent taste, and I congratulate you. I am glad that I meet with your approval, but your enthusiasm is rather strange.' Tell me the reason of this extraordinary tone. Good, I will tell you. Let us go for a stroll. He saw that she gave him a quick glance of suspicion, as he proposed an appointment with her for ten o'clock. After a moment's thought, she agreed, sat down in a corner, and was silent. About ten o'clock she picked up her work and her parasol, and signed to him to follow her as she left the house. She walked in silence through the garden, and they sat down on a bench at the top of the cliff. It was by chance, said Raisky, who was hardly able to restrain his emotion, that I have learnt a part of your secret. So it seems, she answered coldly. You were listening yesterday. Accidentally, I swear. I believe you. Vera, there is no longer any doubt that you have a lover. Who is he? Don't ask. Who is there in the world who could desire your happiness more ardently than I do? Why have you confidence in him and not in me? Because I love him. The man you love is to be envied, but how is he going to repay you for the supreme happiness that you bring him? Be careful, my friend. To whom do you give your confidence? To myself. Who is the man? Instead of answering him, she looked full in his face, and he thought that her eyes were as colourless as those of a water sprite, and there lay hidden in them a maddening riddle. From below in the bushes there came the sound of a shot. Vera rose immediately from the bench, and Raisky also rose. He? he asked in a dull voice. It is ten o'clock. She approached the precipice, Raisky following close at her heels. She motioned him to come no farther. What is the meaning of the shot? He calls. Who? The writer of the blue letter. Not a step further unless you wish that I leave here forever. She rapidly descended the precipice, and in a few moments had vanished behind the brushwood and the trees. He called after her to take care, but in reply heard only the crackling of the dry twigs beneath her feet. Then all was still. He was left to torment himself with wondering who the object of her passion could be. It was none other than Mark Volokov, pariah, cynic, gypsy, who would ask the first likely man he met for money, who leveled his gun on his fellow men, and, like Karl Moore, had declared war on mankind. Mark Volokov, the man under police supervision. It was to meet this dangerous and suspicious character that Vera stole to the rendezvous. Vera, the pearl of beauty in the whole neighborhood, whose beauty made strong men weak. Vera, who had mastered even the tyrannical 
Tatiana Markovna, Vera, the pure maiden, sheltered from all the winds of heaven. It would have seemed impossible for her to meet a man against whom all houses were barred. It had happened so simply, so easily, towards the end of the last summer, at the time that the apples were ripe. She was sitting one evening in the little acacia arbor, by the fence near the old house, looking absently out into the field, and away to the Volga and the hills beyond, when she became aware that a few paces away the branches of the apple tree were swaying unnaturally over the fence. When she looked more closely she saw that a man was sitting comfortably on the top rail. He appeared by his face and dress to belong to the lower class. He was not a schoolboy, but he held in his hands several apples. "'What are you doing here?' she asked, just as he was about to spring down from the fence. "'I am eating,' he said after taking a look at her. "'Will you try one?' he added, hitching himself along the fence towards her. She looked at him curiously, but without fear, as she drew back a little. "'Who are you?' she said severely. "'And why do you climb on to other people's fences?' what can it matter to you who i am i can easily tell you why i climb on other people's fences it is to eat apples aren't you ashamed to take other people's apples she asked they are my apples not theirs they have been stolen from me you certainly have not read proudhon but how beautiful you are he added in amazement do you know what proudhon says he concluded la propriété c'est le vol ah you have read proudhon he stared at her and as she shook her head he continued anyway you have heard it indeed this divine truth has gone all round the world nowadays i have a copy of proudhon and will bring it to you you are not a boy and yet you steal apples you think it is not theft to do because of that saying of Proudhon's. You believe then everything that was told you at school? But please tell me who you are. This is the Bereshkov's garden. They tell me the old lady has two beautiful nieces. I too say, what can it matter to you who I am? Then you believe what your grandmother tells you? I believe in what convinces me exactly like me he said taking off his cap is it criminal in your eyes to take apples not criminal perhaps but not good manners i make you a present of them he said handing her the remaining four apples and taking another bite out of his own he raised his cap once more and bid her an ironic good day you have a double beauty you are beautiful to look at and sensible into the bargain it is a pity that you are destined to adorn the life of an idiot you will be given away poor girl no pity if you please i shall not be given away like an apple you remember the apples many thanks for the gift i will bring you books in exchange as you like books Proudhon? yes proudhon and others i have all the new ones only you must not tell your grandmother and her stupid visitors for although i do not know who they are i don't think they would have anything to do with me how do you know you have only seen me for five minutes the stag's breed is never hidden one sees at once that you belong to the living not to the dead alive and that is the main point the rest comes with opportunity i have a free mind as you yourself say and you immediately want to overpower it who are you that you should take upon yourself to instruct me he looked at her in amazement you are neither to bring me books nor to come here again yourself she said rising to go there is a watchman here and he will seize you that is like the grandmother again it smells of the town and the lenten oil and i thought that you loved the wide world and freedom are you afraid of me and who do you think i am a seminarist perhaps she said laconically what makes you think that 
Well, seminarists are unconventional, badly dressed, and always hungry. Go into the kitchen, and I will tell them to give you something to eat. That's very kind. Did anything else about the seminarists strike you? I am not acquainted with any of them, and have seen very little of them at all. They are so unpolished, and talk so queerly. They are our real missionaries. And what does it matter if they talk queerly? While we laugh at them, they attack the enemy, blindly perhaps, but at any rate with enthusiasm. What enemy? The world. They fight for the new knowledge, the new life. Healthy, virile youth needs air and food, and we need such men. We? Who? The newborn strength of the world. Do you then represent the newborn strength of the world? she said, looking at him with observant, curious eyes, but without irony. Or is your name a secret? Would it frighten you if I named it? What could it mean to me if you did disclose it? What is it? Mark Volokov. In this silly place my name is heard with nearly as much terror as if it were Pugachev or Stenka Razin. You are that man? she said, looking at him with rising curiosity. You boast of your name, which I have heard before. You shot at Nil Andreevich and let a couple of dogs loose on an old lady. There are the manifestations of your new strength. Go and don't be seen here again. Otherwise you will complain to Grandmama? I certainly shall. Goodbye. She left the arbor and walked away without listening to his rejoinder. He followed her covetously with his eyes, murmuring as he sprang to the ground a wish that those apples also could be stolen. Vera, for her part, said not a word to her aunt of this meeting, but she confided nevertheless in her friend Natalia Ivanovna after exacting a promise of secrecy. End of chapter 18《Chapter Nineteen of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After leaving Raisky, Vera listened for a while to make sure he was not following her, and then, pushing the branches of the undergrowth aside with her parasol, made her way by the familiar path to the ruined arbor whose battered doorway was almost barricaded by the fallen timbers. The steps of the arbor and the planks of the floor had sunk, and rotten planks cracked under her feet. Of its original furniture there was nothing left but two moss-grown benches and a crooked table. Mark was already in the arbor, and his rifle and huntsman's bag lay on the table. He held out his hand to Vera, and almost lifted her in over the shattered steps. By way of welcome, he merely commented on her lateness. The weather detained me, she said. Have you any news? Did you expect any? I expect every day that you will be sent for by the military or the police. I have been more careful since Raisky played at magnanimity and took upon himself the fuss about the books. I don't like that about you, Mark. Your callousness and malice towards everyone except yourself. My cousin made no parade of what he had done. He did not even mention it to me. You are incapable of appreciating a kindness. I do appreciate it in my own way. Just as the wolf in the fable appreciated the kindness of the crane. Why not thank him with the same simplicity with which he served you. You are a real wolf. You are forever disparaging, detracting, or blaming someone, either from pride or... Or what? Or by way of cultivating the new strength. Scoffer! He laughed as he sat down beside her. You are young and still too inexperienced to be disillusioned of all the charm of the good old times. How can I instruct you in the rights of mankind? And how am I to cure you of the slandering of mankind? 
you have always a retort handy and nobody could complain of dullness with you but he said clutching meditatively at his head if i am locked up by the police she finished that seems to be all that your fate still lacks but for you i should long ago have been sent off somewhere you are a disturbing element are you tired of living peaceably and already craving for a storm you promised me to lead a different life what have you not promised me and i was so happy that they even noticed my delight at home and now you have relapsed into your old mood she protested as he seized her hand pretty hand he said kissing it again and again without any objection from her but when he sought to kiss her cheek she drew back you refuse again is your reserve never to end perhaps you keep your caresses for she drew her hand away hastily you know i do not like jests of that kind you must break yourself of the stone and of wolfish manners generally that would be the first step towards unaffected manhood tone and manners you are a child still occupied with your a b c before you lie freedom life love happiness and you talk of tone and manners where is the human soul the woman in you what is natural and genuine in you now you are talking like raisky ah raisky is he still so desperate more than ever so that i really don't know how to treat him lead him by the nose how hideous it would be best to tell him the truth about myself if he knew all he would be reconciled and would go away as he said he intended to do long ago he will hate you read you a lecture and perhaps tell your aunt god forbid that she should hear the truth except from ourselves should i go away for a time why it could not be arranged for you to be away long and if your absence was short he would be only the more agitated when you were away what good did it do there is only one way and that is to conceal the truth from him to put him on a wrong track let him cherish his passion read verses and gape at the moon since he is an incurable romanticist later on he will sober down and travel once more he is not a romanticist in the sense you mean sighed vera you may fairly call him poet artist i at least begin to believe in him in his delicacy and his truthfulness i would hide nothing from him if he did not betray his passion for me if he subdues that i will be the first to tell him the whole truth we did not meet interrupted mark to talk so much about him well what have you done since we last met she asked gaily whom have you met have you been discoursing on the new strength or the dawn of the future or young hopes every day i live in anxious expectation no no laughed mark i have ceased to bother about the people here it is not worth while to tackle them god grant it were so you would have done well if you had acted up to what you say but i cannot be happy about you at the Sforgins, the youngest son, Volodya, who is fourteen, declared to his mother that he was not going any more to Mass. When he was whipped and questioned, he pointed to his eldest brother, who had sneaked into the servants' room and there preached to the maids the whole evening that it was stupid to observe the fasts of the church, to go through the ceremony of marriage, that there was no God mark looked at her in horror in the servant's room and yet i talked to him for a whole evening as if he were a man capable of reason and gave him books which he took straight to the bookseller these are the books you ought to put on sale he said did you not give me your promise she said reproachfully when we parted and you begged to see me again 
all that is long past i have had nothing more to do with those people since i gave you that promise don't be angry vera but for you i would escape from this neighborhood to-morrow escape where everywhere there are the same opportunities boys who would like to see their moustaches grow quicker servants rooms if independent men and women will not listen to your talk are you not ashamed of the part you play she asked after a brief pause do you look on it as your mission she stroked his bent head affectionately as she spoke at her last words he raised his head quickly what part do i play i give a baptism of pure water are you convinced of the pureness of the water listen vera i am not raisky said mark rising you are a woman or rather one should say a bud which has yet to unfold into womanhood when that unfolding comes many secrets will be clear to you that have no part in a girl's dreams and that cannot be explained experience is the sole key to these secrets i call you to your initiation vera i show you the path of life but you stand hesitating on the threshold and your advance is slow the serious thing is that you don't even believe me do not be vexed begged vera affectionately i agree with you in everything that i recognize as right and honorable if i cannot always follow you in life and in experience it is because i desire to know and see for myself the goal for which i am making that is to say that you wish to judge for yourself and do you desire that i should not judge for myself i love you vera put your trust in me and obey does the flame of passion burn in me less strongly than in your raisky for all his poetry passion is chary of words but you will neither trust nor obey me would you have me not stand at the level of my personality you yourself preached freedom to me and now the tyrant in you appears because i do not show a slavish submission let us part vera if doubt is uppermost with you and you have no confidence in me for in that fashion we cannot continue our meetings yes let us part rather than that you should exact a blind trust in you in my waking hours and in my dreams i imagine that there lies between us no disturbance no doubt but i don't understand you and therefore cannot trust you you hide under your aunt's skirts like a chicken under a hen and you have absorbed her ideas and her system of morals you like raisky enshroud passion in fantastic draperies let us put aside all the other questions untouched the one that lies before us is simple and straightforward we love one another is that so or not what does it lead to mark if you don't believe me look around you you have spent your whole life in the woods and fields and do you learn nothing from what you see in all directions he asked pointing to a swarm of flying pigeons and to the nesting swallows learn from them they deal in no subtleties yes they circle round their nests one has flown away probably in search of food when winter comes they will all separate and return in spring to the same nest i believe you when you talk reasonably vera you felt injured by my rough manners and i am making every effort i have transformed myself to the old-fashioned pattern and shall soon shift my feet and smile when i make my bow like tit nikonich i don't give way to the desire to abuse or to quarrel with anybody and draw no attention to my doings i shall next be making up my mind to attend mass what else should i do 
you are in the mood for joking but joking is not what i wanted sighed vera what do you want me to do so far i have not even been able to persuade you to spare yourself for my sake to seize your baptisms to live like other people but if i act in accordance with my convictions what is your aim what do you hope to do i teach fools do you even know yourself what you teach for what you have been struggling for a whole year to live the life that you prescribe is not within the bounds of possibility it is all very new and bold but there we are again at the same old point i can hear the old lady piping he laughed scornfully pointing in the direction of the house you speak with her voice is that your whole answer mark everything is a lie therefore away with it but the absence of any notion of what truth is to supersede the lies makes me distrustful you set reflection above nature and passion you are noble and you naturally desire marriage but that has nothing to do with love and it is love and happiness that i seek vera rose and looked at him with blazing eyes if i wished only for marriage mark i should naturally make another choice pardon me i was rude he said in real embarrassment and kissed her hand but vera you repress your love you are afraid and instead of giving yourself up to the pleasure of it you are forever analyzing i try to find out who and what you are because love is not a passing pleasure to me but you look on it as a distraction no as a daily need of life which is no matter for jesting like raisky i cannot sleep through the long nights and i suffer nervous torture that i could not have believed possible you say you love me that i love you is plain but i call you to happiness and you are afraid i do not want happiness for a month for six months for your life long and even after death asked mark scornfully for life i do not want to foresee an ultimate limit i do not and will not believe in happiness with a term but i do believe in another kind of intimate happiness and i want to make me embrace the same belief yes i know no other happiness and i would scorn it if i knew it good-bye vera you do not love me but are forever disputing analyzing either my character or the nature of happiness we always get back to the point from which we started i think it is your destiny to love raisky you can make what you will of him can deck him out with all your aunt's tags and evolve a new hero of romance every day forever and ever i haven't the time for that kind of thing i have work to do ah work and love with happiness as an afterthought a trifle do you wish to build a life out of love after the old fashion a life such as that lived by the swallows who leave their nest only to seek food you would fly for a moment into a strange nest and then forget yes if forgetting is so easy but if one cannot forget one returns but must i return if i don't want to is that compatible with freedom would you ask that i cannot understand a bird's life of that kind farewell vera we were mistaken i want a comrade not a schoolgirl yes mark a comrade strong like yourself i agree a comrade for the whole of life is that not so i thought said mark as if he had not heard her last question that we should soon be united and that whether we separated again must depend on temperament and circumstances you make your analysis in advance so that your judgment is as crooked and twisted as an old maid's could be you don't look to the quarter whence truth and light must come 
Sleep, my child, I was mistaken. Farewell once more. We will try to avoid one another in the future. We will try. But can we really not find happiness together? What is the hindrance? She asked in a low, agitated tone, touching his hand. Mark shouldered his gun in silence and walked out of the arbor into the brushwood. Vera stood motionless, as if she were in a deep sleep. Overcome by grief and amazement, she could not believe he was really leaving her. Where there is no trust, there is no love, she thought. She did not trust him, and yet, if she did not love him, why was her grief and pain at his going so great? Why did she feel that death itself would be welcome? Mark, she cried in a low voice. He did not look round, and although she repeated the cry, he strode forward. Mark, she cried breathlessly a third time, but he still pursued his path. Her face faded, but mechanically she picked up her handkerchief and her parasol and mounted the cliff. Were truth and love to be found there, where her heart called her? Or did truth lie in the little chapel that she was now approaching? For four days Vera wandered in the park and waited in the arbor, but Mark did not come. There was no reply to the call of her heart. She no longer hid her movements from Raisky, who came upon her from time to time in the chapel. She allowed him to accompany her to the little village church on the hill, where she usually went alone. She remained on her knees with bowed head for a long time, while he stood motionless behind her. Then, without a word or a glance, she took his arm to return wearily to the old house where they parted. Vera knew nothing of his secret suffering, of the passionate love which attracted him to her, the double love of a man for a woman, and of an artist for his ideal. Raisky wondered what the shots meant. It need not necessarily be love that drove her to the rendezvous. There might be a secret of another kind, but the key to the mystery lay in her heart. There was no salvation for her except in love, and he longed to give her protection and freedom. Again he found her at twilight praying in the chapel, but this time she was calm and her eyes clear. She gave him her hand and was plainly pleased to see him. "'You cannot imagine, Vera,' he said, "'how happy it makes me to see you calmer. "'What has given you peace?' She glanced towards the chapel. "'You don't go down there any more,' he said, pointing to the precipice. She shook her head. "'Thank God!' he cried. "'If you are going home now, take my arm.' he said, and they walked together along the path leading across the meadow. You have been fighting a hard and despairing battle, Vera. So much you do not conceal. Are you going to conquer this agonizing and dangerous passion? And if I do, cousin? she asked despondently. The richer for a great experience, strengthened against future storms, your portion will be a great happiness, sufficient to fill your whole life. I cannot comprehend any other happiness, she said thoughtfully. She stood still, leaning her head on his shoulder, and her eyes filled with tears. He did not know that he had probed her wound by touching on the very point that had caused her separation from Mark. At that moment there was the report of a shot in the depths below the precipice, and the sound was re-echoed from the hills. Raisky and Vera both started. She stood listening for a moment. Her eyes, still wet with tears, were wide and staring now. Then she loosed her hold of his arm and hurried in the direction of the precipice, with Raisky hurrying at her heels. When she had gone halfway, she stopped, laid her hand on her heart, and listened once more. A few minutes ago your mind was made up, Vera. Raisky's face was pale, and his agitation nearly as great as hers. 
She did not hear his words, and she looked at him without seeing him. Then she took a few steps in the direction of the precipice, but suddenly turned to go slowly towards the chapel. I am not going, she whispered. Why does he call me? It cannot be that he has changed his attitude in the last few days. She sank down on her knees before the sacred picture and covered her face with her hands. Raisky came up to her and implored her not to go. She herself gazed at the picture with expressionless, hopeless eyes. When she rose, she shuddered and seemed unaware of Raisky's presence. A shot sounded once more. With a cry, Vera ran over the meadow towards the cliff. Perhaps my conviction has conquered, she thought. Why else should he call her? Her feet hardly seemed to touch the grass as she ran into the avenue that led to the precipice. End of chapter 19